All right, First John chapter 1, I suppose is where we'll probably uh, dig in here in just a few moments. First John, you can go ahead and just uh, turn to the first chapter. It'll be just a, a bit before we get there. This is a little bit different sort of a structure, so I'll ask you to bear with me and... Uh, Quite a bit of the first part of this is manuscripted, so I hope you'll forgive that, but listen carefully to what I say. And um, I want to speak to you on the topic of assurance of salvation. Our personal experience certainly is one valid way that a believer might consider as evidence for the assurance of his or her spiritual salvation. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that personal experience of Jesus is the most common sort of evidence that we are asked to consider as a kind of litmus test for genuine biblical conversion. It's not my suggestion this morning that the evidence of experience is invalid or without warrant or even unbiblical. Certainly anyone who reads the Bible understands that experience plays a significant role in a believer's relationship to the Lord. I point you to the Psalms, certainly. As you know, the Apostle Paul himself often testified to his experience, his life situation, and it came in the form of a testimony of what he was like before he was saved and what he was like after he had met the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. Thus we see Paul before Agrippa, arguing for the drastic change of life as giving warrant to his genuine conversion experience with Jesus. So again, I say the Damascus Road experience became evidence, proof if you will, for the Apostle Paul. It was evidence of a transformed life that was compelling both, I believe, to his own self-understanding and to those who observed him. So I say again, experience rightly interpreted can provide powerful evidence for the believer's assurance of salvation. Certainly all of us have memorized 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We, We know that text of Scripture. I might even add as an aside that there is at least one Christian scholar, William Alston, who has argued quite forcefully for a person holding certain beliefs in God and being justified, considered rational even by the academic secular world, on the basis of experience alone. Now that might not seem like much to you all, but trust me, it's a pretty big deal out in the big boy world. God is not limited this morning, ladies and gentlemen, to the way he might create an entry point into our lives. The mind isn't the only avenue in which God may choose to intervene into our life. Where would we be this morning if not for God's self-attesting witness in our experience, even in our emotions? Where would we be without God's self-attesting witness in the world itself, in creation? Where would we be if it were not for God's self-attesting witness, certainly in the Word of God? But that being said, it still raises a couple of key questions for probably most of us this morning. I would say it like this. Number one, what if there has never been a time in your life when you did not affirm Jesus? In other words, you can never think of a time when you did not venerate and affirm and confess Jesus as the resurrected Lord Christ and Savior. Two, what if you can't echo the words of the Apostle Paul who said, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence, and all because I did this ignorantly in unbelief. I used to uh, sit under the ministry of John Vaughn, and some of you know him from Greenville, South Carolina. And Dr. Vaughn used to say something like this, I'm paraphrasing, that one's experience in salvation, that is, how we feel in our experience about our conversion, 
is tantamount to the, to the amount of sin from which we repented. Now, that's not to say that if one repented from lots of sin, he has somehow achieved a better status before God than those who haven't repented from as much overt sin, say, if you were converted as a child. But there is some truth to what Dr. Vaughn is saying. Sometimes our experience, for those of us who have been saved all of our lives, as it seems, since we were children, it's, it, it, it may not be as experientially real to us. Again, I am not suggesting that personal experience is invalid, but here's what I want to suggest, as kindly as I can, and that would be this. That feelings alone, or experience alone, should not be the only basis of a believer's assurance of his right standing before God. Perhaps some of you can identify with this, and I hope you'll forgive me for using a personal experience I know that some are opposed to that homiletically, but I think it connects with you, and perhaps many of you can identify with this. I'll never forget when I was a brand new believer, I had come to Christ later in life. I was 22 years old, and shortly, just a few months after that, I was thrust into a college atmosphere. It was very strange for me. I I didn't even know such place existed in the world, and then to find myself there was, was a shock. It was a culture shock. And I had wrestled with this matter of salvation, and there are various reasons for that, and I don't need to go into all those details. It's unnecessary. It's not the point. But I recall being in my own apartment one evening with some friends with whom I roomed, and the friend's parents, and they had brought this preacher over to chat with me and to talk with me because my friends knew I had really wrestled in my soul about assurance of my salvation. I just could not get a handle on it. It was tormenting to me. For months, it was tormenting. And to the best of my knowledge, I was doing everything I could to follow the Lord. I mean, drastic change. But somehow I wasn't settled in my heart. And I think this gentleman meant well. I think he really wanted to help me, and he took his Bible out, and he began to share with me, and really on the assumption that I wasn't a believer. And to make a long story short, at the end of the day, this was what this fellow told me. He said, you know, the way I got assurance of my salvation was when I came to realize that Jesus Christ literally offered in a cup, as it were, to the Father in heaven, real, literal blood for my sins. And when I came to really appreciate that, God gave me the assurance of my salvation. And sir, if you didn't know that when you came to Jesus, you're probably not a Christian. Now, he was trying to help me, but that for him was a litmus test. Did I have the right theological understanding of the propitiatory work of Jesus Christ, particularly as it relates to his blood, if I did not have that sort of experience, that knowledge at the point of conversion, that meant I probably didn't have the right information in order to be saved. I will never forget what I told that gentleman in my very unsophisticated way. Sir, I've never been too good at grace, graciousness, I guess. Sir, if what you're telling me is true, then I'm going to take this Cambridge Wide Margin Bible that these people gave me, and I'm throwing it in that lake, and I'm going back to Middleton, Tennessee. He didn't help me. He created more angst and more doubt. And perhaps some of you can understand that. You know, sometimes... This isn't unusual for a believer to doubt salvation. That's the the personal experience. But we look back through church history, as we look back through those who have loved Jesus Christ, we can see that other believers have wrestled with the same matter. Now, this isn't Scripture. This is reading from a confession of faith. But listen to how, in shorthand form, how theologians can sort of sum up the experience of a believer. Again, this isn't scripture, but it's a shorthand way for us to get at what I'm trying to say to help us understand that this isn't unique to us today. I'm quoting here, which says, True believers may have the assurance of their salvation shaken in many ways, diminished and intermitted as by negligence and persevering of it. Now notice the reasons why. By falling into some special sin 
which wounds the conscience, grieves the spirit, by sudden, sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance, and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet, are they never so utterly destitute of that seed of God, that is, the life God has implanted in the believer, and the life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are supported from utter despair. Now, I have had privilege of feeling what utter despair is like. And I call it a privilege because God has often given opportunities through ministry to help others who have felt the same way about their conversion experience. Perhaps maybe if you can't relate to my personal experience, nor can you relate to the shorthand way of expressing a believer's doubt, perhaps you can relate to this one. You're a Christian, to the best of your knowledge. Perhaps you're at camp, or you're at some revival meeting. And these kinds of questions, again, with good motives, to, to simply try to help and articulate and to, to drive home the absolute necessity of one's knowing for sure that he is a believer in the Christ who died for him. Perhaps the question comes in this form, or one of these forms. Do you remember when you were saved? you know the date? Do you remember what happened on that occasion? Did you ask Jesus into your heart? Did you pray to receive Christ? Do you remember a time when you prayed to receive Christ? Did you repent of your sins, all of them? Did you trust Jesus as Lord? Not just as Savior, but as Lord too. And then, of course... Did you really mean it? And the list could go on ad infinitum. Here's the deal. There may be some justification to these questions. But one has to ask himself or herself, which is the key question? What if I can answer yes to one minister's question and confess I must answer no to the other minister's question? It seems to me that on the basis of these questions alone, I am left to trusting my memory, the credibility of the speaker, my own sincerity, my theological knowledge, my change of mind, or the articulation of the right words of the right kind of prayer with the right motive. It even may lead me to believe to have faith in my own faith. As kindly again as I can say that this morning, or say it this morning, an affirmative response or faith in any of those alone is altogether insufficient. So what then? Does God have anything to say about this matter? Please, I understand that all of these questions are intended as stimulus for us to think about our salvation experience and our standing before God. And I suppose there is a legitimate duty of leaders in the church to do that for us. I'm sitting here looking at this next sentence and it runs on for a long time, so maybe we should uh, listen carefully to it. While affirming the legitimacy of personal experience as a means of recollecting our coming to salvation, and affirming ongoing patterns of Christian experience as one possible line of evidence for the basis of assurance, I do want to remind us in a most emphatic way that our interpretation of our own experience or the experience of others, no matter what our station in the church, be it initiation into salvation or the ongoing Christian experience, can never be the ultimate justification or grounds for our assurance, ever. 
The ultimate grounds for our assurance is God's interpretation of our experience. It must be God's Word. It must be the Bible in conjunction with the Spirit. Now, having said that, is there a place in Scripture where you and I could turn for ourselves or to turn in order to counsel some other person who is struggling with this whole matter of the assurance of salvation? In other words, is there a place in God's Word where I can say with some authority that God has provided a most sure word of revelation that speaks directly to the question of our eternal destiny and assurance? I would say to you this is not just an essential issue, it is the ultimate issue. Now, with the Lord's help this morning, let's turn to 1 John And let's see if we can't look at some of the objective side of this matter of assurance of salvation. Now, we've, we've spent some time on the subjective side. Let's see if we can look at this objective side. And I'm, I'm going to group these topically because we all know that 1 John is difficult to go through in a linear fashion. So I've grouped these ideas topically through my own study of the book. I argue this morning that there is an objective side. There is biblical evidence that we can point to, that we can look at. And by the help of the Spirit, ministering the Word of God to our own hearts, we can have the assurance that God wants us to have because of His grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let's look first of all at verses 5 through 7. As we see, number one, the first objective evidence of salvation in verses 5 through 7 of chapter 1, I would say, is living in the truth. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth, but... If we walk, or if we live in the light, that is, if we live in truth, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from literally every sin. And so, one of the objective tests to which I would point is this business of living in the truth. Are you truthful about Scripture, about God, about Jesus, and moreover, are you truthful about yourself? which he's going to remind us of in the next few verses. Are you a person who believes and live in open and honest and transparent, even though you're not perfect? Do you have a passion for what is truth and what is right? Number two. Part of that truth is given to us in verses 8 and 9, and I would say that the second objective evidence of a believer, a true believer, is sin confession. Not just to God, but about sin itself, particularly as it relates to us. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, let me go to verse 10 because of the structure of this text and read it, and I'll come back to verse 9. I used to be able to brag about having the most hair of the Bible faculty and the best eyes, but I'm slowly losing ground on both of those. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, go back to verse 9. However, if we confess our sins, if we agree about sin, not only our need to confess our sin to God, but the fact that we are sinful and have sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, are you a sin confessor? Do you agree with God about this matter of sin? What is sin? Sin is the transgression of God's moral law. All unrighteousness is sin. And if you want a complete list, go to Exodus chapter 20. You'll have a whole catalog of what it means to sin in the form of the Ten Commandments. So are you honest about having sin, about doing sin? Are you a regular sin confessor? Do you desire truth? God's truth. Number three. 
Chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. I would say the third objective evidence is obeying Jesus' commands. Verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. And one of the ways you can read the book of 1 John is just ask yourself this question. You have right side of the issue and wrong side of the issue. If you're on the right side of the issue, that's good. If you're on the wrong side of the issue, the truth he's stating, that's not good. That's a very practical way of looking at it. It's, a very, it's very binary. It's very either or, First John is. So either you're on the right side or the wrong side. And none of us is ever on the right side, always, all the time. That's why we need the gospel. But is there a general direction, at least passion and desire in your heart, although we all fail miserably, but at least from the heart, that is your desire. And you, I can't, I can't look in your heart, but the Spirit will let you know I have to believe that. Verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. I'm glad, well, John isn't politically correct, and the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word, in that person verily is the love of God perfected, hereby we know that we are in him. So obeying the commands of Jesus. He says it another way in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, and still another way in chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. I commend those verses to you, but particularly the command he's talking about here in these other two passages is love for other believers. Love for God. Love for other people. That's patent Johannine or Johannine theology, number four. Because God got, uh, John got it from Jesus. Which brings me to verse 7 of chapter 2 and this whole business of love for other believers. Brethren... Verse 7 of 2, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now is shining. Now notice verse 9. He that saith he is in the light, the one who confesses to be a truthful person, and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion or there is no deception in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. He does not know where he's going because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Ask yourself the simple question. Do you love the fellowship of other people who love truth, who confess their sin, who try to live in the truth, and the best way they know how, they're trying to follow Jesus as they understand it? You can look also at chapter 3, verses 11 to 15, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, and chapter 4, verses 19 to 21. Now, a fifth objective evidence in chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, familiar text, not loving the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. Each one of us is drawn away with, for things of the world. We all still have to go to Walmart. We have to have cars. We have to buy clothes. We can't escape the world. But what I think John is saying here, it doesn't mean that a person can't lapse into a period of his life and be in love with the world and, and, and lose his salvation. I think what it's saying is this. It's the same thing Jesus said in the sermon. You can at the same time have a passion for stuff, mammon, things, and a passion for God at simultaneously. It, it can't happen. And so this is one caution that we are growing cold if we are in love with the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Now all that stuff is passing away, but he that does the will of God abides forever. I think we know what that means. Number 6, verses 20 to 27 of chapter 2, speaks of confession of Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. You know, really, you could sum this whole book up in two very easy categories. Right belief, right ethics. Those are the two objective 
evidences that God gives us in His Word. The right belief, particularly about Jesus, and right behavior. Verses 20 to 27 essentially say that if we do not have a true heart belief of Jesus as the Lord Messiah, it's not a good thing. That's not a good evidence. I raise the question then, why do we believe Jesus is the Messiah and rose from the dead? Do we merely believe because our parents told us that's true? I hope that's part of it. But that's not a good enough reason. I think Scripture teaches very clearly that apart from grace, that is an impossible heart confession. You see, Freud would say if you believe that, you're sick. You you suffer from neurosis. Nietzsche says if you believe it, you simply are either being oppressed by those who have the power or you want power. Mark says it's because you need opium to get along in life, so you have the opiate of religion. Now, what is the difference between your being smart enough or you're just parroting someone else's belief than what the atheists say? There is no difference because at the end of the day, you don't need God for any of those beliefs. Now, I know that's hard. But that's what makes Christianity, Christianity. Confession. You see, let me say a word about doubt here. There are two kinds of doubt. And anyone wrestling with transcendent truths and supernatural things like people rising from the dead and walking on water, those things that violate our modern sensibilities that cannot be duplicated... If you're honest, you wrestle with doubt. And doubt is not a bad thing as long as it's not skeptical doubt. You look throughout the church fathers, there is a such thing as believing doubt, and that can be healthy. God can even use that to give us greater certainty and truth, a, a, a certitude of the truth of what we know by His Spirit. Disbelief, skeptical unbelief, that is sinful. That is wrong. Look at the story of Thomas. Look at Peter's example. Think about Augustine. Think about Luther. Think about Calvin. Think about Spurgeon. You look to any great leader in the church, every single one of them, without fail, struggled with doubt. Every single one of them. Now, in chapter 5, as we make our way to the end here, There are several things tied together. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So you can't believe that truly from the heart, from the heart, unless you are born of God. You cannot believe that in a salvific way. And you can believe it as a historical fact, I suppose. But the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith are two different people, ladies and gentlemen. Scholarship will even tell you that. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So if you love God, you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you love God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. You see how all these things now are tied up together? Proper understanding of Jesus, keeping God's commandments, loving other believers, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not a burden to us. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. There's the 215 illusion right there. Not loving the world, but somehow, some way, by the grace of God, we ultimately have victory over the world, although we struggle with the world and the flesh and the devil. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That, my friends, is supernatural belief. Now, if you, if you check me out the whole time, and I understand it, would you please look at the last text I want to point you to and listen to what I say, particularly if you're wrestling with this or know someone who is. Look at verses 10 through 13. And this is the crux, I believe. This is the final objective evidence that we could point to from Scripture about how can we know that we are assured of salvation. 
He that believeth on the Son of God, verse 10 of chapter 5 says, hath the witness in himself, the self-attesting witness. Chapter 2, verses 27 and 28 speak of the anointing of the Spirit, the attestation of the Spirit and the heart and life of believer. I can't tell you. I can only point you to truth. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in your faith, in your prayer, in your confession, in your repentance. No! It is in Jesus, the Son of God. Now notice these next verses. If you don't mind, I'm going to paraphrase these just to kind of capture... The sense of the terms here. The one who is having the Son now is having, and that word there, I I believe, through the study I've been able to do, I believe it's tantamount to knowing Jesus. The one who is knowing the Son is having life. But the one who is not having or not knowing Jesus, not the Jesus of history, but Jesus as the Messiah, Son of God, divine man, That person, if you do not know that Jesus, you do not have eternal life. And there are a lot of Jesuses. There were Jesuses in the first century, many Jesuses who were miracle workers. There are Jesuses of Mormonism, Jesuses of Jehovah's Witness, Jesuses of all kinds of Jesuses. But the only Jesus that saves our soul is the Jesus of faith, the God-man, whom God must give us the capacity to believe in by His grace. Now, that's the crux. Do you have the Son? You know what? I heard Dr. Barrett, who just preached here the other day, say in a Greek class one time, now this man is well educated, been a Christian a long time. He looked at his class and said, so what, brethren? So what if I believe for the first time today? The issue isn't what I have done in the past. The issue is in what or in whom am I trusting right now. That's the issue. And that's true because that is exactly what 1 John 5, 10 to 13 says. Now, do I deny the fact that you can get saved in past time? No. Obviously, there is an event before this this moment in which we affirm Jesus. But that is not the issue. That is not the basis of our assurance. The basis of our assurance is our confession at this moment and our hope at this moment. That's the basis of our assurance. Now let me conclude by offering you, very briefly, just a list here, and I don't have time to go into them, from Os Guinness' book, God in the Dark. You'll recognize the play on C.S. Lewis's title, God in the Dark. Reasons why Christians doubt. Number one, the doubt... From ingratitude. Ingratitude will cause you to doubt God. Number two. Doubt from a faulty view of God. That was exactly what my problem was when I was a new Christian, is I had a faulty view of God. It's not all about me. It's not all about Jeff Capshaw and his cognitive affirmation. It's about what God has done for me. Three. A doubt from weak foundations. Again, that has a theological rub to it. Weak foundations. You look at 2 Thessalonians, bad theology always leads to bad action. Always. Number four. An unsigned contract. Lack of commitment. And some of us are hanging right there. We just haven't committed wholly to Jesus. That will cause doubt. Number seven, a doubt from the lack of growth. Stunted spiritual growth will cause us to doubt. Number eight, boy, I can relate to this one. Doubt from unruly emotions. Unruly emotions not being controlled by the Spirit of God. Number nine, and I know that many of you can relate to this one. Doubt from hidden conflicts. Some of you have had terribly, egregiously wrong violations of your own personage and you haven't dealt with it. And you need to let the gospel deal with that. 
Doubt from inquisitiveness. Hello, professors. I call it the academic curse. Finally, doubt from impatience. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I have good news for you this morning. Jesus died for our impatience. Jesus died from our intellectual curiosity, for our intellectual curiosity. He died for our hidden conflicts. He died so that we can press on to maturity. He died so that we could affirm wholeheartedly and commit to Him to follow Him with our lives. He died for our lack of competency with the Word and truth. He died so that we could have a right view of God. And He died, yes, even for our own ingratitude, our doubts, our unbelief. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father, with Martin Luther, we pray, Dear Lord, although I am sure of my position, I am unable to sustain it without Thee. Help Thou me, Lord, for I am lost. Use Your Word, we pray, dear Father, in Christ's name. Amen.